again. Good morning, bro. If you could uh, please open your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. Oh, all right. Come on. And uh, we are going to be continuing our Exodus series. Uh, you'll have to uh, forgive me up front here because we're starting to get into the section of Exodus that talks uh, very detailed about the building of the tabernacle, uh, about the, the priestly garments, and some other very, very exciting things of that nature. Uh, but before we jump into that, let's go to Matthew chapter 16 here. And uh, please give it up again here for Jana and for Rosie uh, for really incredibly uh, for a community contribution. Yeah. All right, so Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. I'm going to get a running start here uh, with uh, really a short story about Jesus. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But well, what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Mm. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We'll stop right there. The title of the sermon today for Exodus part six is I will build my church. Whoa. Now here, uh, it's, a, it's a great passage. Of course, uh, Jesus had already started his ministry at this point. He had been healing people uh, physically and spiritually. And really, he's coming to his disciples. He's saying, hey, what are people saying about me? Now, people had been saying some great things about Jesus. They recognized him for sure as a powerful prophet of God. I mean, they're like, maybe this is Elijah who rained down the fire on the prophets of Baal. Maybe this is Jeremiah who, who preached to the kingdom of God in one of its darkest periods of time, right? But really, Peter was the only one who understood that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was also the Messiah. He was the son of the living God. He was God in the flesh. And he had come onto earth for one reason, to build his church. Pretty cool, right? And so Jesus comes, he says, I will build my church, but also I am going to give you, my disciples, the keys to the kingdom. That's pretty cool, right? So you can imagine, I don't know if you have maybe a rich friend or something like that, and you can maybe imagine your rich friend, he, he pulls up to your house in his brand new Lamborghini. And he comes up to you and he says, you know, I want you to drive my Lamborghini. And he hands you the keys to the, to the kingdom of God right there, you know, the Lamborghini. Now, you know that it's not your Lamborghini, it's his Lamborghini. But he's allowing you to take responsibility for it and take it for a, a real a joy ride right there. And if you're going to take the Lamborghini, then you know you better bring that thing back without even a scratch on it right there. Because there's no way that you're going to be able to pay for the scratches on that Lamborghini. You are going to take it very seriously uh, that your friend is letting you borrow this amazing vehicle. But here, imagine Jesus gives us literally the kingdom of God. He puts it in our charge. He says, as my disciples, I want you to take on my purpose and to help me to work with me to build my church. Whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Right. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, it's amazing because God also protects the church. He says, not even the gates of hell will succeed wow. in its assault against the kingdom of God. Right. And so that should give us a lot of security being in the church of God, knowing it doesn't matter what Satan does, he will never succeed in tearing down Jesus' church on. here on earth. On. Pretty on. awesome. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Right. Exodus chapter 25. Now, now we're going to get into all the details, awesome. all the exciting details of the book of Exodus. Let's do it. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You will receive the offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. Wow. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, Ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather. 
acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breast piece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. We'll stop right there. And so here we're in Exodus, and we know that Exodus is in many ways here, and actually in some incredible, incredibly detailed ways, a foreshadowing for the building of the new covenant church in Jesus Christ. And so there is a ton of stuff here that, that God is using through the old covenant to point to Jesus and to point us to the church that he's going to establish after Jesus' sacrifice. Now here we look at it. It says they're about to build the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle itself becomes a foreshadowing of the Christian. And when you bring all the Christians together all over the world, that forms God's church. And so the Holy Spirit resided in the inner sanctuary. Now as disciples of Jesus who are baptized, the Holy Spirit resides literally in our bodies. And so our physical bodies become like tabernacles and God dwells among us. But here God says we're going to build the tabernacle And the materials that we're going to use need to be given sacrificially from the people. And it must be the best materials that they have. Mm. The gold, the silver, the costly gemstones, even the the goat's hair and the dyed red leather and, and all the best materials that they have is what the people need to give to build God's kingdom. Now, the builders of the kingdom are those whose hearts have been prompted by God. And so it's an interesting passage, you know, for me, and I always think about this. God calls us into a loving and willing relationship with him. And so do we have to be in the relationship with him? No, we don't. But do we have to be in the relationship with him? Yes, we do. Because if we don't respond willingly, what happens? The tabernacle does not get built. And so he wants us to give our hearts willingly. But if we don't, the consequences mean the church does not thrive. The church is not built the way that God wants it to be built. And so God asks for our best. He wants our finances. He wants literally our skills, our talents, our hard work. He wants our blood, our sweat, our tears. He wants our investment into his kingdom. Now, it has been uh, very exciting recently for midweek. We've been going to Boston Public Garden. Yeah. And uh, we've been sharing our faith, and it's been exciting. And, uh, and it was actually cool. I was reflecting on our time at Men's Midweek in Boston Public Garden Because I realized that we were going to, you know, the garden of Boston, Massachusetts, right? And Jesus, he would always go to the garden of Gethsemane to draw close to God. And so I realized after we shared our faith in Boston Public Garden, I was like, wow, there's something kind of spiritual about this. It's the workers of God going into the garden to really till the soil right there and to harvest a crop for eternal life. But we are the workers that God has called and he asks us to give our heart willingly and he asks us to give our very, very best. Now you go on here and there's many different things that they were called to build in the tabernacle. So the first thing mentioned, of course, is the ark. And the ark is, uh, it's very fascinating, the whole concept of the ark, because the ark, of course, is a picture of the body of Christ, which saves us as disciples. Wow. The ark was also literally the boat that saved uh, Noah and his family when the flood came. And of course, now the ark here in the time of the Exodus is what houses the law. It's what houses Aaron's budding staff. And it even houses a, a jar filled with manna that fed the Israelites while they were wandering in the desert. And so you have the, the ark, which is a picture of the church. And you realize what is in the church. Well, you've got the scriptures. You've got our, our ultimate authority that we follow, which is the word of God. You've got Aaron's budding staff. That is the leadership in God's church that is called by God to direct his people faithfully and bear fruit. Amen. And then you've got the jar of manna, which is just the Holy Spirit. God allows us to feed on the Holy Spirit as he guides us in the body of Christ. And so you see what they're building here becomes a foreshadowing for what we're building today. Now, also there uh, in chapter 25, it says they are charged to build the table. Now, the table is very interesting. It's, it's a table, and on the table, there is bread, and it's called the bread of God's presence. And on uh, the table, there's 12 loaves of bread that are separated and laid out right there in the most holy place. Mm-hmm. Now, you say 12. Okay, well, 12 is the tribes of Israel, so there's one loaf for every single tribe. But then you also have to think about the foreshadowing of now Jesus, before he goes to the cross, he's with his 
12 apostles who are to build the new covenant church and they gather and they break bread with Jesus in communion before he gives his life for the salvation of the world. And so there's some amazing foreshadowing happening right there too. Now then it says in the end of chapter 25 that they have the lampstands. And we know from Revelation that each lampstand is a symbol of each church all over the world. And so the priests, they needed to light the lampstands in the tabernacle so that they could see while they were ministering to God's old covenant. And so the world is full of darkness. We need churches everywhere in the world to provide light for God's saved people and to save more people so that we can be directed to heaven as we follow him. Pretty cool stuff right here, right? Yeah. And so you see what God is trying to do. Point number one, a kingdom of priests. Now, it goes on here and into chapter 26 and 27, it talks more about the building of the tabernacle. It talks about the altar of burnt offering, the courtyard, uh, and the oil for the lampstands. And then in chapter 28, it starts to get into the priestly garments. And so I want to uh, try to paint a picture of what this whole area of the tabernacle looked like. And then I want to try to make it relevant to us today, okay? So, So try to follow along with me if you can. Okay, so, and this will help too in your quiet times. Whenever you get to this section of the Bible, uh, maybe you'll be excited to read through it instead of just skipping to the next chapter. You know what I mean? Come on. Okay, so imagine, if you will, you uh, you have this courtyard. And the courtyard is surrounded by a rectangular fence. Now, there's only one entrance into the courtyard. And, of course, that means there's only one entrance into the church. And that's through Jesus. Amen. And so there's only one entrance into the courtyard. And then inside the courtyard, you have a bronze altar. And then next to the bronze altar, you have a bronze wash basin. And so this is outside the tabernacle right there in the outer courtyard. So if you want to come into the tabernacle first, you have to walk through the gate. Then you have to walk through the courtyard. You have to make a sacrifice at the bronze altar. And then you have to wash yourself at the bronze basin. And so you cannot come into the presence of God. You cannot come into the church without a cost. And you cannot come into the presence of God without being washed. And so you see some great symbolism there. Then you have the actual tent. And so there's curtains that are hanging, another smaller rectangle into the, inside the larger rectangle of the courtyard. And then you have the holy place inside, immediately inside the tent. And then you have the most holy place, which is basically like the inner sanctuary uh, of the tabernacle there. So you walk into the tent, you have the table of the bread. You have another altar. This is a golden altar, and this has incense on it, which is a symbol of the prayers of the saints. And it's a, it's a more precious metal, right? So the closer you get to God, the more beautiful your relationship with him really is. Wow. And then you have the golden lampstands there, which are a symbol of the churches. Then you have the most holy place separated by another curtain. And inside there is the Ark of the Covenant. And there's two angels called cherubim whose wings are covering and protecting the ark. And so God says, literally, the ark is under his wings. And so as disciples, when we get baptized, we come to the church, we come under the protection of God. We come under God's wings. Pretty cool, right? And so you see all of that happening right there. Now, what's very neat here is that all of this literally is a physical representation for what now happens spiritually when we come to God today through the new covenant. And so we see the church and we see all the outward activities of the church. You can imagine all the different things that you see out there in the outer courtyard. But then there's this deeper relationship with God that we only see after we've given up everything at the bronze altar and we've washed in the water of our baptism, and now we start to enter the tabernacle and the inner sanctuary. And God is always revealing his presence to us more and more the deeper we get into our relationship with God. Now, back then, those that served in the tabernacle were priests, and they could only be appointed as priests, right? So not everybody in Israel could be a priest. But we know that the prophecy from Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, was that God was going to build a kingdom where everybody is a priest. And we also know from 1 Peter 2 that that was established through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So now as disciples, every single disciple of Jesus becomes a priest in the new covenant tabernacle of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so now we all serve in the tabernacle by our own free will, not because we're charged to do it and everybody can be a part of it if they really want to be. Pretty cool stuff, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I also think here that we need to examine our hearts, right? Because it's very easy to say, for example, hang out around the tabernacle, but never go inside. Come on, bro. And so you can imagine, say, the parable of the sower. There's the first soil that never really allows the word of God to come into their heart. They never come through the gate. Yeah. But then there's the second soil that comes through the gate, but then just kind of hangs out there in the courtyard and maybe doesn't really get deep enough with God, doesn't, make, doesn't give up everything, doesn't wash completely so they can never really enter the most holy place. Wow. But then maybe there's a third soil that does do that. They enter the holy place, but they never get deep enough to get to the most holy place. Wow. And really to get to the most holy place, you have to have that pure, undefiled heart before God. Wow. And that's the heart that every disciple is called yeah. to have. Come on. Come on, bro. Go to Exodus chapter 28. So you guys with me so far here? A lot of details there. Yeah. Trying my best to break it down uh, as concisely as possible. Come on, bro. Exodus Come chapter on, bro. 28, verse 33. Now, we understand that they had to build the tabernacle. You saw the labor. You saw the sacrifice that goes into it. And you saw that there's this body of priests that become really a symbol for us today. Now, also here in Exodus chapter 28, what we see is that the priests were required to wear certain garments. Now, I also find this very fascinating because we're charged in the New Testament to put on the clothing of Christ. So we no longer have these very specific garments that were worn by the priests in the Old Testament, but we do clothe ourselves with the Spirit of God every morning when we let our feet hit the ground and we get out of bed. And so we pray and we have quiet times and we say, hey, I'm going to be spiritual today. I am going to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And we literally put on our garments and clothe ourselves with Christ. But you look at the garments here and, and there's really a, a few different articles of clothing they had to wear. The first one was called the robe of the ephod. And that was their full robe or, or gown, if you will, uh, what, what it would look like for us today. And then over top of that robe, they had the actual ephod, which would look similar to something like a vest. And then over top of the ephod, they would have a breastplate. And the breastplate would literally lay over their heart. And then on the breastplate would be 12 different gems uh, inlaid inside there. And each one represented the, you know, a tribe of Israel. And so whenever a priest came into the tabernacle, it was said they were carrying the, the people on their heart to intercede for them before God. And so every disciple carries with them daily the concerns of the saints, right? That's what Paul said in the gospels and so here that's what the role of the priest was they came before god they wore their garments and they served for the people now also attached to the breastplate was what was called uh the urim and thummim and so these were used to direct god's people and the priest actually held them in a pouch over their heart attached to the breastplate pretty cool right now today we don't use that anymore but what do we have written on our heart the word of god And so we now have God's word written on our hearts. We have the concern of the church and of the lost written on our hearts. And we minister to God every single day by being Jesus' ambassadors. Pretty cool stuff, right? Okay, Exodus 28, verse 33. Specific thing here attached to the garment that I want to point out. And it says here, Exodus chapter 28, verse 33. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. The gold bells and the pomegranates are to alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. We'll stop right there. So I was focusing on this one uh, part of the garment here in my studies and I realized it's a very interesting uh, command here. So you've got all these different parts of the garment and then there's this one part where you have just these pomegranates and then these bells, and they're attached to the hem of the robe. And so every time they entered the tabernacle, the bells needed to be you know, jingling there, and then they had to have the pomegranates also represented on their bodies. And I was thinking, I was like, what does this mean? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Come on. Come on. Come on, bro. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And let's get a look at the New Testament church here, the New Testament tabernacle, if you will. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We'll stop right there. Now, fascinating. So the priests in the Old Testament had the little jingle bells. And they had the pomegranates. In the New Testament, there's no jingle bells or pomegranates, but what is there? There's a pure and joyful and fired up heart for the Lord that everybody around them can see and hear. And there's a fruitfulness in the body of Christ because they're evangelizing the world and they're getting the message of the gospel out there and people are being added to God's kingdom. And I was like, wow, this is intense. And so it was supposed to bring a sense of joy to the people. The ministers of God are doing what the ministers of God are supposed to be doing. And we're fired up and we're grateful about that. And there's a fruitfulness in God's kingdom. You know, really, this is the amazing thing about being part of a church of disciples. Really, this is it. It's that we know that God has brought us into the kingdom and we've given up everything because we stand in awe of the living God and we're just grateful, as Jana shared about, to be able to even serve at all in the kingdom of God, even if we're just a doorkeeper and we have no talents at all, we're just opening and closing doors. Like, I would rather open and close doors all day for God than be anywhere else in the world. Because God has delivered me from my sins and given me an opportunity to be in God's family. And those are your jingle bells right there. The jingle bells of your soul as you walk around the world. And when we have this gratitude and when we stand in awe of God, well, then people have a light that directs them. They have a lampstand to follow in an, in an otherwise incredibly dark and horrible and wicked world. And we know what it was like before we saw the light shining in our lives. Yeah. And so it's a byproduct of our relationship with God. Yeah. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2. We give our whole heart to God. We fall in love with the living God and God changes us from the inside. And now we attract more people into a relationship with him. You know, truly, I do love my church, ICC, hashtag Facebook. I really do. Like, I love the kingdom of God. I mean, even just last week, wasn't last week incredible watching the videos from Nigeria? Yeah. I mean, it is incredible. We have a hundred different churches on six different continents, and we are growing all the time. Come on. Because we have disciples Come all on, over the world with the same purpose who understand that we are called to be a kingdom of priests and evangelize the world. Right. Yeah. And out of a gratitude for God delivering us, we go out and we're just praying. We're literally hoping and yearning to meet somebody who wants to love God too, yeah. because how much does that that fire you up when you meet somebody who really wants to love God too. It fires you up. I love everything about the kingdom. I love that anybody in the church has the authority to walk up to me with the Bible and tell me to repent. I I actually love that. That fires me up. So you can come up to me. I'm opening the floodgates right here. You can come up to me and you can read me a scripture and I have to repent to it. I have to change my life because God is my authority. But I love that. Because in the kingdom, uh, outside yeah. the kingdom, I had no direction in my life. Yeah. I was lost and I was captive to my sin and it was the Bible that set me free. Oh, so I pray that God will send people in my life to show me what I need to repent of according to the scriptures. On, I'm fired up that I have a purpose that's bigger than the purpose I had before. Yeah. Now, I'm a lawyer, so I feel like that was a pretty cool job. <laughs> but this is way better. I would rather preach the word and, and have my life changed so I can go to heaven and help other people go to heaven than be a lawyer yeah. Yeah. any day of the week. Come on. This is a way deeper and more satisfying purpose than anything else that the world has Come to on, offer. Yeah. Now, there was a time in my discipleship where I would get bitter that God would mold me and discipline me. There was a time. There really was, believe it or not. And, uh, and we, should, we can all relate to this, right? God would bring discipling into my life, and I would be like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> There's no way that's true. And my emotions would lead me. And then finally I realized, what in the world am I doing right here? God's trying to change me. God's trying to make me be like, Jesus, why would I ever reject the discipling of God in my life? And then I started to have a different perspective about suffering and about discipline. And I realized that when I was being disciplined by God, that is the coolest thing that could ever happen to me. And then I started to get fired up, even about the quote unquote hard times in God's kingdom, right? You know, we have the truth. We have salvation. We have everything. And we have the family of God to boot because God gives us everything that we desire. Awesome. Come on. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 
Now, we do have to be careful because, of course, God does fulfill us and he gives us everything and we're under his protection and it's awesome to be in the kingdom but we do have somebody who's trying to steal that away from us and there is an enemy of god and and really he's trying to steal away our joy john 10 10 jesus came to give us joy to give us life to the full but the enemy is coming to steal away our joy and if he can steal away our joy then he gets a great victory because he might be able to steal us out of the church and he might be able to steal our soul but then also without any joy, what impact can we make? Come on, man. There will be no pomegranates. There will be no fruit without our gratitude and our, and our joy before God. Yeah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Sober mind meaning don't be high on drugs and don't get drunk with alcohol. You have to have a sober mind. Come on. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Wow. Now, it's cool. It acknowledges that we have family all over the world right there. Yep. So that's, that's awesome, right? We have family literally in every continent all over the world. But it says, understand that we need to keep a, keep a clear and spiritual frame of mind yeah. because... Satan is going to try to take away our gratitude and he's going to try to take away our joy and he's going to use the suffering that God allows us to feel so that we can be molded and try to warp that into something bad so that we get bitter and we lose our relationship with God. And so that's the battle, right? The battle is now to stay faithful, stay joyful, stay fired up in a relationship with God. Not allow the enemy to take that away from us because if he does, then he can really win the battle for our soul. You know, I challenge you for point number one that I want to give the church, and, and I'm going to do this too, so I'm going to be doing, that, uh, doing this alongside of you guys this week. Cool. But I wanted to give a challenge to the church to really reflect and write down your conversion story. And so there's a few different parts of your conversion that I'd like everybody to uh, kind of like write down and journal about. Number one, what was your old life like, and where were you headed before you became a disciple? Come on. What was your old life like and where were you headed before you were a disciple? Number two, how did God intervene through the quote unquote coincidences that happened when you were met by disciples? Yeah. Who shared with you and what were the different circumstances of that quote unquote coincidence right there? Number three, what was it like when the truth of the gospel finally pierced through the hardness of your heart? Yeah. What did you think? What did you feel and what did you experience during that time? Number four, what do you remember when you were baptized? What was that like? And then finally, number five, how has your life changed since you were baptized? Come on. How are you different now than the way that you were before? Now, I really want to give a charge here to all the disciples to really take some time this week before next Sunday and really write this out. And I'm actually going to be doing it too. Because I think it's very important for us, as we really fight against the temptations of of Satan here, to remember what God has done for us. To keep our joy, to keep a pure heart, and to keep our love burning for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Point number two here. Come on, bro. Point number two, hot, cold, or lukewarm. Okay, let's do it. Exodus chapter 29. Point number two, hot, cold, or lukewarm. Come on. All right, so we'll hop back here to Exodus chapter 29. And uh, we've already seen now the building of the tabernacle. We've seen the priestly garments. And now here, uh, it starts to get into the consecration of the priests. Now, I want to focus on one passage. Let's go to verse 38. Chapter 29, verse 38. It says, This is what you are to offer on the altar regularly each day. Two lambs, one year old. Offer one in the morning and the other at twilight. With the first lamb, offer a tenth of an ephah, the finest flour, mixed with a quarter of a hint of oil from pressed olives and a quarter of a hint of wine as a drink offering. Sacrifice the other lamb at twilight with the same grain offering and its drink offering as in the morning, a pleasing aroma of food offering presented to the Lord. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. Let's stop right there. Now here, uh, the consecration of the priest takes place, and the charge is then given to the priest to do a daily sacrifice. 
And so remember, we now are the priests, right? We, each disciple becomes a priest in the new covenant church of Jesus Christ. But here the charge was for the priest to every single day go to the tabernacle, actually twice a day, once in the morning and once a night, with a brand new unblemished offering of a one-year-old lamb. And then they would slaughter the lamb and they would give a continual burnt offering of two new lambs every single day before God in the tabernacle. And so you can imagine now as disciples, what is this foreshadowing? Well, in a very beautiful way here, this is foreshadowing our daily relationship with God. And so every single day we wake up and we give a brand new, undefiled, unblemished offering of a one-year-old lamb, the one-year-old lamb of our heart right here, and we put it on the altar before God as we get close to him as disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, you've got to imagine what this is like, right? Because that means every single time they went to make a new offering, well, they'd have to come into the temple. They'd have to wash. They'd have to come in with their lamb. They'd have to prepare the altar. They'd have to get all of the old ashes from the previous offering off and out of the altar. They'd have to clean it off right there. They'd have to slaughter the, the new lamb. They'd have to get it up on the altar, and then they'd have to re- restart and rekindle a new fire there to offer this new sacrifice to the Lord. And so you can imagine the labor that went into yeah. each of these new sacrifices two times every single day for the priests that were serving in the temple. Come on. Now here, understand that this is a symbol of the Christian life, our devotional life specifically, before God. Come on. Are we in the routine every day of waking up and emptying out the ashes of that last previous day. Sometimes it's like the previous day, the previous day, the previous day, and like the previous 10 years right there because yeah. Satan's really piling on the ashes. Mm-hmm. We got to clear that junk out Come on. and offer a brand new undefiled sacrifice, rekindle a new fire Come to on. burn that sacrifice and really get close to God for a brand new day with Come the Lord. On. That's what it's all about right there. Serving in God's kingdom day after day after day. Now, we will have many different peaks and valleys in life. And I've understood as I've become a disciple that the peaks and valleys of life are guaranteed, not because we're disciples, but just because we have life, right? (laughs) And so disciple, non-disciple, you will go through hard times and you will have great times. Now, the people of God, the Israelites, they had great times of prosperity and then they had times of exile. And so there was times where they felt fired up in their relationship with God. And then there was times when literally Jerusalem was destroyed. But they still, the, the priests still had the charge to sacrifice two undefiled lambs in the presence of God every single day. Come on. It didn't matter if it was times of prosperity. It didn't matter if it was times of exile. Every single day, the priest had the charge to get close to God. Yeah. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Come on, Come on bro. Revelation Come on. chapter 2, verse 4. And now we're going to take a look at a couple of the lampstands here, which are, of course, the churches. Come on. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, there's a passage where Jesus is speaking to one of the churches, the church in Ephesus. And he says the following. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, it's a, it's a sobering charge here that Jesus levels against the church in Ephesus because we realize that now we're in a spiritual kingdom and being part of the people of God is not something that you're born into, but it's something that you have to keep up with by continually having a pure heart before God and staying in love with Him. Yeah. And so we can fall away from our relationship with God even when we're in the church because it's about having that pure heart and really being in love with him not just being around the tabernacle you with me and so that's what it's about we keep the continual fire burning in our hearts day after day after day as we clear away the ashes of the previous days and rekindle a new fire to offer the new unblemished sacrifice to the lord and so that is the charge of the new covenant church now here, the, the word that's used is forsaken our first love. And here's how I feel sometimes. Sometimes I feel like I'm drifting away from God. Yep. 
And I've realized over time that there is no passage that says I am drifting away from God. But there is a passage that says I've forsaken God. Yeah. And so it is not what we think it is sometimes yeah. when we're judging ourselves, right? Yeah. We judge ourselves with a very easy measure. Right. And we say, oh, I've just been drifting away. No, no. Jesus is saying if we're not running towards God, then we're running the other direction. Yeah. Wow. And so we have to make a decision every Come day. On. Who are we going to run to? Are yeah. we going to run to God or are we going to run to the world? Wow. You know, we've got to rekindle our relationship with God. Go to Revelation 3, verse 16. And we know this passage very well. It's to another church, the church in Laodicea. And it says, Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. And so we understand what is Jesus trying to preserve? Jesus is trying to preserve an undefiled relationship where we continue to be in love with him every single day of our lives. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says we must fan into full flame the gift of God that he's given us, right? So you can imagine this image of us fanning into flame the daily burnt offering to God. It's a work that we have to do in our devotional life to keep a pure heart before him. Now, for us, we've got to reflect from time to time how full is the fire in our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. How full is the flame? Are we fanning it into life? Mm -hmm. Are we doing the work of getting down on our knees and, and really clearing out that garbage that Satan tries to shove in there that's going to prevent us from having an awesome fired up and, and really being in love with God relationship? Because that is the call of the scriptures. Sometimes we do have to let go of the past. Yes. We, have to, we have to forgive. I realized recently that sometimes I just got to forgive myself for stuff. Yeah, well, it might not that. even be other people. Come it on. might just be things that I felt hurt that I failed in and I never let go of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And we've got to let go of that stuff, shed it off, clear yeah. the ashes, and let's bring a new sacrifice Come to on. the Lord. Come on, bro. Come on. You know, if we want to do the things that we did at first, after we were baptized, then we have to clear away the ashes of our hearts. Yeah. We got to clear away the ashes because the reason we did those things when we were first baptized is because there were no ashes yet. Yeah. It was undefiled. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been through anything yet as disciples. Yeah. We get older, we mature, we go through things, and now we have to really continue in this maintenance of our hearts Come to on, protect man. our relationship with God. That's awesome. yeah. That's awesome. This is about quiet times. Yeah. It's about our daily relationship with God. I want to lift up a brother, uh, Jay Scagliota. Come on, Jay. And I want to lift up Jay because uh, Jay uh, recently shared for good news that he had read through the entire Bible. Yeah. And, uh, and that's awesome. That's awesome because, you know, he's still a relatively uh, young Christian here. And, and he just got baptized, you know, not that long ago. And he's openly admitted that maybe the first few months of his discipleship, he... You know, was kind of just doing his own thing anyway right there. But he got into the Bible and he made a decision, I'm going to be with God every day. I'm going to read my scriptures. And now in just a short period of time, he's already read through the entire Bible. Pretty cool, right? As he shared that, he had already bought a brand new Bible and he pulled it out in his good news sharing. He said, and I already started to read it again. Cool. And now I'm about to start my second read through of the scriptures. Now, I love that because that is Jay trying to keep his relationship with God on fire. Right. Yeah. He, he's trying to keep the past. He's protecting his relationship with God and not letting Satan get a foothold in his heart. You know, the challenge here is really to be hot, to be on fire for the Lord. Come on. And it's a relationship. It's about having a fiery relationship with God, that, that reckless love for God, right? When you're in love, you just go crazy and you do stupid Fire stuff. It says that people in love are, are deaf, blind, and dumb. Yeah. And really, it's okay to be deaf, blind, and dumb for the Lord. Come on. Yeah. It's okay to be Come like that, on. the reckless love in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on. Come on. When you go to Exodus 30 and you start to read through the rest of the book of Exodus here, you, you start to see that God is trying to mold his people to be a certain way. He wants them to be a praying people. He wants them to be a sacrificial people. He's calling them to be a grateful people, yeah. to be a cleansed people. He says, you are an anointed people. And isn't that cool that we are God's anointed wow. people in the new covenants? Right. And he says, I want you to be a saved people. Right. I want you to be my people. Come on. And so we are the people of God, the kingdom of priests in the awesome. new covenants. Come on. Amen. You know, this is what building the church really is about. The daily walk with God 
the gratitude with God, and out of an overflowing joy, we just want to bring more people out of the darkness and into the light. Come on. Because we know, we remember where we came from, and we want to help other people too. Yeah. Yeah. To close it out here, the challenge is to rekindle the joy of your salvation and to rekindle the fire in your hearts so that we can get out there and save the world. Amen? To God be the glory.